Chapter 2. The Storm In a different yet connected place high above the land, where all living things understand they are connected. Clouds amassed on the horizon in mounting processions like tribes of warriors presenting themselves to be counted for battle. Waves of angry gray shadows mingled and darkened into billows that expanded over the land of salt water and thick trees. On a calm day in Pesamaquate Bay, waves melodically rolled on top of one another, creating a soothing rhythm of energy that connected all families living with the land. Early and unwelcome winds from the south altered the measure, creating an anxious uneasiness in the air that was difficult to understand. Salty winds from the south collided with cold air lingering in the bay and churned the waters into swirling portals of blue that led to the wonders and dangers beneath. <clears throat> Building momentum from the cold waters below, the south winds ripped into the shoreline and penetrated the shield of trees lining the boundary of the land. Sounds of trees thrashing and snapping ricocheted off the rocks and eddied into sounds of waves crashing below. The new rhythm was erratic, disorganized, and announced the arrival of a disturbing and unfamiliar spirit. All families living with the land could tell stories of storms that tested their faith in the Creator to protect them. Something unfamiliar about the winds and energy from this storm that brought, un that brought unrest and uneasiness to the land. Olona took a, formid a formidable and unsheltered red spruce tree on the Siptak Peninsula shielded the peninsula from headwinds of storms as an early warning to the land. The towering giant is also home to the lookout nest built by the eagles for their sentinels. The silhouette of Olo, as he is affectionately nicknamed, stands as a beacon of security while his weathered and unearthed roots tell tales from legendary storms of the past, yielding unimaginable power and unrelenting force. Every branch on the tree, whether it held needles or not, lived on the bowl with enduring persistence to fulfill their purpose to provide refuge to the eagles as they fulfill their duty as the protectors and guards of the land of salt water and thick trees. The land is defined by the watershed of the Siptuk River that empties into Pasamukwate Bay and encompasses all the shoreline that connects these areas and the hundreds of islands across the archipelago. Boundaries of the land were defined by rugged cliffs on the archipelago side of the peninsula and the bountiful coves and inlets on the land side that can be described as havens of food and shelter from storms. Across the cove, the jagged shorelines reach up the rolling and vast red forest that burned over 100 years ago. The great fire cleared the land, scorched the soil that spared Olo and his family. The towering and protective older siblings on the peninsula provided seeds to bring life back to the mainland. Olu and his family continued to provide a windbreak to shelter the younger trees until they had put down their roots to withstand the storms that invaded the cove. <clears throat> Across the bay, the Lakawak River watershed that defined the western boundary of the land and etched pathways of life to every corner of the forest of peace before ending at the great mountain. The dense, and, the dense and lush vegetation of the understory provided refuge and food, and the canopy above offered protection to the living things that, that inhabited the forest of peace. Some of the trees, like quaking aspen, are connected by their roots with young trees carrying the same knowledge and wisdom of the original mother tree throughout the entire forest. There are many examples of this across the land where stories and legends are carried forward to help the animals, Birds, fish, and humans survived the oftentimes harsh conditions Mother Earth presented. The culmination of these stories taught a lesson in balance and its importance to maintain the relationship between the living things and the land on which they survived. Imbalance in the land can lead to unnecessary conflict and destruction, while maintaining balance only required the observance of a simple set of principles and laws that are maintained by the Siptak Fire Council. 
The vast territory of the land is governed by the council who meet with the seasons at the base of Olo's trunk. The ancient red spruce towers over the archipelago that separates Passamaquoddy Bay and the Forest of Peace has befriended many young eagle sentinels standing guard. There is an understanding and ever-evolving peace amongst the families that, it is re that is reaffirmed with the seasons by gathering around the fire in the shadow of wisdom and knowledge provided by the crown of the old red spruce tree. It, it took over a century for Olo to put down the roots he needed to withstand the winds that shaped the land around him. As the oldest and most wise of the red spruce on the peninsula, Olo endured many of the storms that were captured in stories of bravery and legends of survival that were passed down around the fire from father to son and mother to daughter. He was a solemn he was a solemn witness to the celebrations in times of feast and the desperation in times of famine. He understood that for there to be peace in the land, there sometimes must be conflict to restore balance. For everything that appears to be beautiful, there will be something about it that is equally unappealing to maintain the balance of nature. Olo understands there is sometimes suffering in the land when the power structure between the families breaks and creates inequality amongst the animals, birds, fish, and humans. Olo shared the knowledge and wisdom from his 200-foot perspective with each eagle sentinel that perched in his branches. The old red spruce often found his stories created more questions than understanding and felt, the <clears throat> and felt the concept he shared to be beyond the comprehension. Sorry, I lost my spot. <coughs> Beyond the comprehension of the young e <coughs> the old red spruce often found his stories created more questions than, uh, than understanding and felt the concepts he shared to be beyond the comprehension of the young fledglings that were commissioned as centuries until recently. There was one promising yet aggravating exception to this general rule, and his name was Tuiwe. The young sentinel intuitively translated the messages Olo wove into his captivating and inspiring stories, yet patronized the old tree for trying to distract him with juvenile lessons he learned as a fledgling. Often reassuring nervous young eagle sentinels, Olo shared stories of legendary storms from the past and their phenomenal power to distract them from the light breeze that was tossing around the lookout during the storm of the moment. Tonight was not one of those nights. Olo felt a menacing wave of, of, of uneasiness hover above him as he began to sway more vigorously back and forth in the strengthening storm. The timing and strength of the storm did not make sense, and he knew none of the families in the land were prepared to move. Overlapping gusts of wind tested the limits of his bowl and began to succumb to the force, trying to twist and snap his trunk. He could taste the salt air and the needles at the very top of his crown, and this sensation meant something. Olo was not sure what it meant, but for the time in his, for the first time in his memory, the usually calm and om omniscient spruce worried about whether he would survive the storm. He was anxious for the on-duty sentinel to be relieved so he could talk with his more intellectual replacement. Where is Chuiwe? He should be here by now. Maybe you should go look for him, suggested Olo to the young probationary sentinel. I was told to stay at my post until I'm relieved directly by my replacement. And I can see him flying up the cove right now. Thank you, young sentinel. You can head home now, said Olo, as he hurried the young eagle out of the nest. Olo watched as Tuiwe skillfully navigated the shoreline of the peninsula towards the majestic giant and circled his crown to pay his respects before landing softly in the lookout nest. The young eagle shook the cold of the storm from his feathers in preparation for his evening watch. Although only three years old, he possessed the maturity of his white head and tail feathers, an honor usually saved for older eagles. While he was viewed as respectful and helpful, he regularly rejected the role his family expected him to fulfill. To sway his thinking, Tuiwe's father secretly asked Olo to tutor the young eagle with his 200 years of wisdom and knowledge about the land. He was desperate to help him accept his path in life and embrace his destiny as the future leader of the soar. The wise old spruce found the request to be an onerous task 
as these types of tasks often are when you are trying to convince someone to do something they do not want to do. Hello, my elder brother Olo. What story do you have for me this evening? asks Juiwei with a playful squawk. He arrived at his post early as usual and greeted Olo with his nightly request. While the stories Olo told While the stories Olo told the most wildly entertaining accounts of storms battle <coughs> The stories Olo told were the most wildly entertaining accounts of storms, battles, celebrations, tragedies, and tales of love and devotion. Chuiwe hung on every word and sometimes got lost in the details and needed to be reminded of a hidden meaning woven into the excitement. Olo never tortured him over the higher meaning of the story. Rather, he led him down the path straight to it. Nothing like the conversations he endured with his father. Chuiwe enjoyed <coughs> his time with Olo, as he felt a cerebral connection with the elder that he hid from the other sentinels and his father. While he considered himself smart, he felt more comfortable in the role of warrior rather than the leader his father wanted him to be. He liked being a captain and taking responsibility for the eaglets and training his fledglings. It was a respectable position in the sword, and it was enough for the young eagle. Olo stood stoically quiet and for a moment said nothing in response to the young eagle's question. Rather than answering, the majestic tree offered only silence that was lost in the ominous creaks and cracks emanating from his trunk as he stood firm against the force of the storm. The pause allowed Tuiwe a moment to hear the wind and feel its power pushing back against his beak. He realized the winds had changed and grown stronger since the night before. He sensed the danger that was radiating through Olo and the negative energy focused his thoughts. Chiwiwe recognized something more was bothering the old tree, more than just the looming storm. A close lightning strike on the shoreline below started Olo into a <coughs> A close lightning strike on the shoreline below startled Olo into asking, Have you spoken to your father? Chiwiwe is son to Macau the hereditary leader of the Sora of Eagles nested within the imposing red spruce of the land of salt water and thick trees on the Siptak Peninsula. Tuiwe was his only offspring and avoided spending any more time than necessary with his father. Although he had promoted him to an important position as a young captain in the Sora, Tuiwe felt his father belittled and insulted him at every turn. Sometimes the young eagle felt as though his father was trying to control every decision he made while at the same time demanding he forge his own path in life. Avoiding his predetermined destiny only served to strain the relationship between Tuiwe and his father. Before becoming obstinate and choosing his own path, Tuiwe tried to reason with his father and explain that the idea of being anything more than a sentinel captain and protector did not speak to him. When his father would not listen to him and instead dismissed its concerns and vulnerability, Tuiwe challenged the older eagle with an ultimatum. The young eagle demanded the ability to decide his destiny for himself, otherwise he swore he would not speak to him again outside of his duties as a sentinel, and he would put all his energy into avoiding the role his father defined for him. I have not seen him tonight. He did say to find him after my century, but I was hoping to get some sleep and find him another time. Came to Uwe. Find him right away, cautioned Olo. It cannot wait. This storm is different and unlike any I have ever stood against. There is something your father needs to tell you. I will take your sentry while you go look for Macau, instructed Olo. There is a lost legend <clears throat> There is a lost legend that recounts the story of a momentous storm with catastrophic effects. I am worried this is only the beginning. Tuiwe could barely hear Olo over the howling winds and crashing sounds from the ground below them. I cannot leave the lookout, the young eagle shouted back. Remember this past winter when I thought for myself and left the post? The ravens from the forest of peace created a distraction and I took the bait. While I led the fledglings in an attack to defend the lookout, they sent a detachment of ravens to raid our food rations. I won't be making that mistake again. Can't you just tell me what's happening? Tuiwe asked impatiently. As if on cue, Macau landed on the edge of the nest opposite Tuiwe. Olo, what did you say to the boy? He demanded harshly. 
Macau is the oldest male eagle in the land and the hereditary leader of the soar, just as his father before him and his grandfather before that. From birth, Macau was raised with a singular focus to follow his, in his father's footsteps to protect the soar, while fathering and mentoring the next hereditary leader. Watching his father drown as a young eagle quickly aged Macau and pushed him down the path towards a life with a single priority. Blaming himself for his father's tragic death, Macau hardened his heart from love and compassion while abandoning any hope of happiness or peace for himself. It made his life simple and detached. He had dedicated his life to the singular purpose of protecting the sore. Nothing, Macau snapped back Olo. It's not my place to tell the boy about the legend behind his life path. Time is not on your side, my friend. You and I both know this storm could be a sign of the legend of Shepulkin, and you are not giving the boy any time to absorb what you need to tell him, Olo slowly countered with indignation. Annoyed with his usually far more pragmatic friend, Olo creaked back and kicked Macau off the nest using the next gust of wind to camouflage his intent. With confidence and poise, Macau thrust his wings back and forth to quickly land on the nest beside Tuiwe and said, The first storm of the season has arrived early, Olo. Stop filling the boy's head with nonsense. Turning his t attention to Tuiwe, Macau held his wing up as an instructional pointer and proceeded to give the young captain an order as a commanding officer. <clears throat> Gather the eaglets and get them into the nests on the leeward side of the peninsula. Winds are strong and coming from the south, he pointed out. It means the first storm of the season has arrived and we need to move the soar now, even if the nests are not ready. It is too early for these winds because there is too much cold air here still. Is that safe? The inland nests are still under construction and there won't be enough food on the other side of the island. The soar from up north is still there, waiting for the first storm winds to carry them home from the summer. Besides, Olo said there was something you needed to tell me, something about this storm and a legend, questioned Tuiwe. Why must you always question what I say? Sometimes I wonder if I shouldn't have left you behind with the other fledglings, rather than making you a captain. I knew you weren't ready. Part of being ready for responsibility is the ability to follow orders without question, flatly stated Macau. <clears throat> the commander saw the pain his condemning words caused the young eagle and quickly looked away to stop the sadness from penetrating any deeper. The dejection swirling with anger in Tuiwe's eyes unearthed a deeply buried memory of an eerily familiar exchange years ago. Paralyzed by the emotions flooding back to him, Macau succumbed to the memory and allowed the last conversation we, he had with his father to replay in his head. His father was the legendary leader and Macau was just a sentinel. There was a harrowing lightning storm that threatened the nests constructed close to the shoreline. With the next lightning flash and roll of thunder above him in the present <clears throat> sorry. The next lightning flash and roll of thunder above him in the present moment, Macau was pulled back deep into the past and found himself sitting in the lookout with Olo years ago. Leading up to that fateful storm, Macau had been sentenced to a permanent night watch for disobeying a direct order from his commanding officer, his father, by leaving the lookout without approval. The distraction of a burning tree and hint of a daringly heroic rescue had lured Macau away from the nest that night, abandoning his post. His dereliction of duty was discovered by Olo, who dutifully reported the abandoned post to his disappointed father. After arriving at the location, of the burning tree, Macau discovered the nest had been evacuated and the fire long ex extinguished. He instantly regretted his decision to leave the lookout and return to his post as quickly as he could. As he grew closer to the lookout, he recognized his father's silhouette sitting in the nest. From that night forward to that, <clears throat> from that, from that night forward to the fateful storm, his father had been punishing him to demonstrate the importance of following orders sent down through the chain of command, without question. As Macau continued to replay the night in his mind, he could hear his father's booming voice ordering him that under no circumstances are you to leave the nest. Do you understand? His father had not waited long enough for the relief sentry to fly beyond earshot. Macau still remembered the anger he felt for his father that night for how he treated him. All that night while on watch, the anger he felt towards his father burned into rage that eventually attached to feelings of guilt and shame in his mind. When they discovered their commander 
Missing in the morning, a search party was dispatched, but it did not take long for his body to be discovered on the rocks along the water far beneath the looming silhouette of Olo. For the rest of his days, Macau would forever connect feelings of embarrassment and shame with the anger and rage for not saving his father. It resulted in confusing exchanges between Macau and Tuiwe that poisoned their relationship. If only I had answered his calls for help. I was so angry at the thought he was trying to trick me with the juvenile test to see whether I would listen to his earlier instructions. If only I had answered him, maybe he would still be alive, echoed the same words that replayed in Macau's sleepless nights after regularly reliving the final moments with his father. A fleeting moment of pain is a small price to pay for a lesson that could eventually save the sore or himself, thought Macau, as he forced himself back into the present moment and turned to face his son. Yes, sir, Tuiwe obligatorily answered. As the young eagle waited for the sting of his father's words to fade, taking off, <clears throat> a jarring crack of lightning shattered a large branch on the red <clears throat> shattered a large branch on the red spruce tree behind them. While the nest in the top of the tree avoided the destructive bolt, fire had erupted directly beneath it and quickly threatened the two defenseless eaglets inside. Macau and Tuiwe simultaneously sprang from the lookout and hurled themselves into the chaotic winds that were feeding the flames climbing towards the baby birds. Each flap of their wings thrust them closer to the nest while in perfect cadence with one, uh, one another. <coughs> Without a word spoken between them, Macau and Tuiwe hovered over the nest to scoop up an eaglet in one of their talons and quickly touched down to ricochet to safety in the nearest tree. Off in the distance, inland towards the cove, another lightning bolt struck a giant red spruce that seemed to instantly incinerate in a cloud of flames and smoke. Lightning was crashing all around them, followed by claps of thunder that shook the ground beneath the mighty trees. Now do you understand the gravity of the situation? Can you just listen to me and do as I say? I do not have time to explain everything to you right now. You need to get these eaglets to safety while I find your mother and the other egg sitters, instructed Macau, trying to be heard over the storm. After everyone is safe, come back here to the lookout. I have more to tell you about this storm and what it means for the sore. Macau paused for a moment, and the distinguished eagle twisted his head to gaze out into the menacing storm on the horizon before looking back at Tuiwe. Well, what it means for you and all our brothers and sisters, even our animal and human brothers and sisters on the ground below. Maybe the boy was ready, but the old eagle was worried. Tuiwe was instantly annoyed. His father always spoke in an elder code that was exhaustingly, exhausting to continually decipher. When Tuiwe could not figure out the significance of what his, father's was, his father was saying, Macau would badger and insult him until one of them lost their temper. Their relationship was defined by this unspoken language and hidden meanings buried in a code that he could not translate. Even when Tuiwe thought he understood the significance of what his father was saying, Macau still seemed angry and displeased with him. Rather than debate with his father, Tuiwe simply nodded and grabbed the eaglets, one in each talon, and took off from the nest. Because he refused to speak to his father outside of his du duties as a sentinel, every conversation between the father and son ended the same way, causing their hearts to harden towards one another. As he flew across the peninsula, he thought to himself, why can't he just say what he means? He makes me feel so small when he talks to me like that. The young eagle was ignorant to how desperate Macau was for him to become a leader and trust his father's teachings. Even Macau did not understand the extent of the legend driving the life path ahead of Tuiwe. All Macau could offer as proof were pieces of an old legend that even he did not understand. With all his wisdom and knowledge, even Olo could not accurately recount the legend. It was passed down from generation to generation, and the last legendary storm wiped out the families that kept safe, the story behind the legend of Sepulchre. While Tuiwe flew the Iglis to safety, the fledglings were carrying out his orders to evacuate the elders and other juveniles. Macau flew over the operation and could see it was organized and efficient, with the elders being carefully guided to safety. He smiled to himself, knowing he raised a confident and capable leader. Tuiwe just needs to accept his destiny, thought Macau. He shook his head in frustration as he landed on the edge of his own nest. What is wrong now? We are experiencing the storm of the ages and you have kept me sitting on these eggs without any sign of an evacuation. What could possibly be going so wrong for you today? 
you were shaking your head like that? Questioned his mate, Mika. As Macau's partner, Mika was the head egg sitter and responsible for the care of eggs orphaned by parents or dropped by predators as they are challenged by the sentinels. Nothing. You're right. We need to get you and the eggs to safety. The nest isn't quite finished, but there are several sentinels working on it right now. You head there and Tuiwe and I will get the eggs to you right away, offered Macau, in the hopes of avoiding any further discussion concerning his unfortunately witnessed head shake. Life became complicated when he met Mika. With intelligence beyond that to which she would display, Mika was the unanimous matriarchal leader of the egg sitters. The chosen mate for the hereditary leader, the union was initiated from practical considerations and grew into one of caring, deep trust, and passionless love. An unspoken understanding between the formidable, formidable pair allowed both to dedicate themselves to their individual vocations, egg sitting and their son. Macau dedicated his life to Tuiwe's training and development into the next hereditary leader, while Mika was the devoted mother for all orphaned eagle eggs discovered in the land. Excellent attempt at avoiding a fight. No, not a fight, a discussion a heated and very one-sided discussion. I'll leave it at that only because the storm is intensifying and I need to get these eggs to safety, she conceded. The egg that arrived before the first full spring moon is close to hatching. I think she is from the outer lands, but no one could track down her family. We are all she has in this land and we cannot leave her here alone. I will take her with me and you send Tuiwe to me with the others. I will see you soon on the other side and keep your spot warm she said, and offered an affectionate nuzzle before gracefully exiting the nest. Macau let out a long, sad whistle that trailed off into the storm behind Mika. As the hereditary leader of the storm, Macau knew what he needed to do as a father. He was not capable. As hereditary leader of the storm, Macau knew, he needed, knew what he needed to do, and as a father, he was not capable of doing it. Mika could do it. She had the strength and patience to feel to Willie's questions and talk him into understanding what the legend could mean and his role in it. She was a skilled parent and could easily command the entire soar. More importantly, she was brave enough to tell her son the truth. There is so much more about the legend he needs to search and figure out for himself and the next six generations of living beings in the land depended on him deciphering the message. That old spruce is right. This could be the storm ahead of the legend of Sepulchre, thought Macau. He and Mika knew from birth that their son was marked with the sign of Sepulchre. Together with Olo and some other discreet elders, the marking was hidden from the Siptuk Fire Council until such time as the small group felt it necessary to disclose the existence of the symbol. So much tragedy surrounded the legend of Sepulchre that both Macau and Olo thought it best to hide the symbol to avoid a fearful reaction from the fire council. The decision was made not only for the sore, but for all living things living with the land. <clears throat> Eagles from across the land passed down legends and other important lessons through pilgrimages to the painted cave and brought the information back to their fire councils for deliberation. Pilgrimage to the painted cave. <clears throat> pilgrimages to the Painted Cave were often clouded by loss. The journey to the Outer Land is a long and arduous one that stressed the elders to exhaustion and were not initiated without consideration of dire consequences. From the pieces that could be remembered by living elders, the legend of Sepulchre spoke of a great eagle spirit destined to protect and save for six generations all living beings living in the land of salt water and thick trees to the forests of peace and the great mountain of the Outer Land. Only a small part of the legend could be compiled from what the living elders in the sore could remember. Few elders could even remember the way to the cave or the secret hidden entrance, but they remembered the treacherous journey that took the lives of some of their brothers and sisters. The painted cave was hollowed out of the great mountain by advancing and receding sheets of ice with the entrance obscured by rocks shifting with freezing and thawing waterfalls. The cave itself was unstable and moving over time as the power of water slowly moved away rocks and collapsed parts of the cave. Many years ago, another eaglet was born in the Siptak Sor with what elders interpreted as a symbol of Sepulchan. <clears throat> the Siptak Fire Council initiated a pilgrimage to retrieve the legend 
from the painted cave in the great mountain. The fire council even sent young eagles along to learn the journey and ensure the legends were not lost as elders passed into the spirit world. Tragedy struck the pilgrimage when the path to the painted cave collapsed from falling rocks and several monstrous boulders. The elders that had reached the cave were trapped inside, while the young eagles that accompanied them were crushed at the entrance and along the path into the cave. The rest of the legend was lost to the ages and died with the elders trapped in the painted cave. When the young eagle was killed by a <clears throat> when the young eagle born with a symbol was killed by a predator, the sword did not speak to the legend again and did not raise it with the fire council. When Tuiwe was born, he was never told that the skin on his chest was emblazoned beneath, with, beneath his adult feathers with a white lightning bolt. It was hidden from him and everyone in the store and on the Siptak Fire Council in the hopes that another tragedy could be averted. When Tuiwe eventually discovered the symbol on his chest, he would need to discover... When Tuiwe eventually discovers the symbol on his chest, he will need to discover the rest of the legend on his own. He would go on to learn the force that guided him to serve the sword was rooted in the ancestral push from within the legend to accept his destiny. When Mikhail saw the lightning bolt on Tuiwe's chest, he was simultaneously filled with pride and fear for being chosen to raise and protect the legend of Sefalken. Seeking counsel from Olo and Nika, Mikhail rendered the difficult decision to hide and symbol from the fire council. Macau allowed the memory to fade from his mind and found himself distantly supervising the migration of the sword to the inland stronghold where they would be safe during the season of big storms. After satisfied everyone had been safely moved, he headed back towards the lookout to meet Tuiwe. His mind unburdened from the worry and pressure of the early relocation, the hardened and unsentimental leader shifted focus to his son. The tactically brilliant yet dispassionate Mikhail was still uncertain on his approach with Tuiwe and pined for Nika's expertise and matriarchal style when approaching a difficult parley with their son. As Mikhail effortlessly negotiated the swirling winds of the storm towards the lookout, he could see that Tuiwe had already returned and was fortifying the nest against the shelling winds. The storm was building and moments before rain fell in sheets from the sky, one final bolt of lightning erupted above Olo. It summoned phenomenal power and commanded a deafening volume as the crack threw Macau backwards in the air. The solid bolt came crashing down into Olo's massive crown with a cascading fire that quickly consumed his needles and fine branches. With force only capable in the spirit world, the energy from the bolt surged through the old spruce and exploded out of the trunk at every branch, including the one supporting the lookout. The branch holding the fortified nest sheared from the bowl of the mighty red spruce and hurled down towards the ground below. Shock waves from the lightning bolt knocked Tuiwe unconscious and hurled him with the nest down to the rocky shore below. Macau watched helplessly as his son tumbled to what he was sure was his premature death.